Thank you very much. <clears throat> Let's see if I can survive the technology here. Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Gertian, to invite me. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure. You, you will not believe it, but this is the first time we appear in person <laughs> after years of videos. Yesterday evening, I saw Mike Turner, whom I spend uh, at least two hours a day you know, discussing, but it was all virtual. For me, it had become a screen. Now I saw him first. <laughs> so first of all, thank you very, uh, very much. I'm, I'm very happy to be here because, you know, originally I'm an academic, although more than life took me into other adventures uh, where I tried to um, somehow combine um, you know, a new vision that comes from research and studies to a vision that, you know, uh, have I done something wrong? No, I'll just get you some water. <laughs> uh, I water it here, look. Yeah, sure, sure. And water sufficient. <laughs> and um, to a vision that, you know, on the contrary, looks at uh, the concrete uh, issues that we have in, uh, in heritage conservation. I think uh, <coughs> Gertian just gave you, you know, uh, essentially the content of my lecture I could finish here because I totally agree with you, 100%. Now the problem is how to do it. And we will have to, to look into, into this thing. Um, also, I am <coughs> happy because I can see other, other friends that are here. I don't know if Anna is here, Anna, brothers, yeah, or, or, or uh, Calliope. Uh, you know, these are a group of people that uh, we gather many years ago uh, in 2000, in the year 2000, when uh, we thought that the way in which the World Heritage Convention was treating uh, historic areas was uh, uh, something that we termed Jurassic, very old-fashioned, and we'll see why. We'll, we'll see why in a minute. So the historical balance recommendation is the collective result of a reflection, uh, but also a political diplomatic action. This was approved by 194 states. It's not something that you know comes. Uh, you know, it's not a you know declaration that comes from a group of experts. And this was approved by the General Conference of UNESCO. So you know, ourselves we were a bit stunned when this happened. But you know, it was there were 10 years of work uh, behind that. And little by little, our group you know, became very solid, very large. Of course, we remember all our friend Ron Van Oors, who unfortunately left us, uh, who was uh, one of the pillars of this. And this group, little by little, became uh, very close. And I think we have you know, tried to uh, at least do the, our part of the work, which is the, you know, the research and the, and the exploration of, <coughs> of this issue. In fact, because, because uh, you know, the historical landscape acronym is HUL, which pronounced HUL, we call ourselves the hooligans, which is, and there's even a t-shirt with that. All right, now <coughs> let's see what uh, we talk about today. I think we will talk about cities and uh, urban, urban heritage, which is not an easy, an easy uh, subject, as uh, I think you all know. Uh, perhaps uh, one of the most difficult today, and this is one of the reason why Harryland has been established because if it was easy, we wouldn't need you. <laughs> so that's, that's a difficult one. And I would like to start with this image. Now, I'd like to ask you, who of you has ever seen this image? Ah, there. How come you've seen this image? Because this is very rare. It's very rare. This comes from this book. Oh, this book. This book, which I bought. I'm a collector of old books, so I like them. I bought because I, you know I you know when Mike and you know, many years ago we worked on Jerusalem and so I thought this was a book on Jerusalem Regni Davidi et Solomon that's me me right so I, I bought it immediately the Temple of David and Solomon and then I found out something very strange that there was a second part to the book which is Consideratio Urbium Maximarum Veterum et Recentiorum Recentiorum which is in Latin <coughs> a study of urban geography done in the year 1739, I can read well, 1739, by a <coughs> German uh, astronomer geographer called Johann Matthias Hasse, or Hayes, Ahas, sometimes pronounced, Hasse or here in Latin, who, I don't know why, had this curiosity of comparing metropolises in the world. You know, we're working a lot on metropolis uh, these days. So when I found it, I was stunned because this is, you know, three centuries old. And th th this person took the time to look at perhaps 30 or 40 
metropolises from all over the world, you know, from Lima, Peru, to uh, Guangzhou in China, going through many European, African cities, and so on. But the only thing that he was interested on was very funny, was the size of it. The, not the population size, the size of it. So, because I was a geographer, so I wanted to measure it. So it, it came with this, with this measure of Amstelodanum, I put it here. You see that, you know, of course, looking at everything and taking away all the well, propugnacolis, the, the fortresses and so on. So, okay, he found that Amsterdam was 558 and a half stadia. Now, don't ask me what is a stadia. I know what a stadia is. But yeah, I crack my head and try to understand. That's why I'm looking at Niels, because Niels, that's your job now to <laughs> understand what a stadia is. He looked at a Roman stadia, you know, which is calculated 185 meters. Uh, but these stadia are quadratorum, so s squared. So uh, if you multiply by square, it comes a very, very difficult number. Anyway, this is you know, a middle-sized city for him. The biggest one in his calculation was Babylon. I think it was simply wrong because Babylon was not <laughs> the biggest city ever done. Um, but you know, he looked at the sources. So he c took all the ancient, the Bible, uh, the ancient uh, Latin and Greek writers and so on, and he made the first uh, global comparison of large cities or cities that I ever seen, and I like to present to you the one he had done in Amsterdam. But you can find this book if you want in the Gutenberg library. I think it's, it's, it's available in online. If you don't find it, come to me. I'll give you the original copy. Okay, now, <laughs> now let's, um, let's have a look at the issue that we want to discuss. Uh, but not forget Amsterdam. We'll come back to Amsterdam uh, at the end. We look at these challenges of urban heritage conservation, which is really a big, a big headache today. I think Gertian gave you the optimistic side. And I would like, you know, on the contrary, to point to the pessimistic side, or the, let's say, at least the problematic side of urban heritage, which you know, is you know, the more we look and the more we find that we encounter problems, encounter you know, dead ends. You know, we try new solutions, new tools, and then new dead ends. So it's not something easy to, to address. And I think it requires a lot of, <clears throat> you know, a lot of uh, attention, uh, research investment, perhaps also policy investment. This is why I think Karen is very important because you talk to the big guys over there. Huh? And, and unless we, we reach that policy level, anything we do is completely doomed and, and you know, it just remains in a, in a, in a nice environment uh, like, like this, but it doesn't, doesn't affect it. So I'd like to focus on three issues that I think are <coughs> worth uh, looking at. And I suggest them, actually, I put them there because I thought that you were interested in research uh, perspective. So I think these are all, each one of them is a research topic. Now they could uh, uh, interest uh, future PhDs or, or And the, the, the three issues I'd like to discuss are, the three issues are origins, conservation, and change. The way in which urban conservation addresses these three issues, I think, you know, it's an important uh, way to understand where are the problems that we find today. Now, in terms of origins, let's be very clear. Urban conservation never existed at the beginning. <laughs> it's just simple as such. Uh, we are, you know, we are in a default because, you know, when heritage was first invented, uh, of course I put just uh, Morris and, 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 and Ruskin, but there are many others. When it was first invented, the, the city was not, uh, was not at all the, the focus. Uh, what was in the city, some of the monuments were there, were focused, but not the city per se. It's a problem because <coughs> for a century at least, uh, the development of uh, uh, tools was, <laughs> was done uh, without uh, looking at the city. And therefore, you know, the entire heritage construction, intellectual construction, is based on something that doesn't consider the city. This is a big issue. I think we have to know that and many of the problems that we have today come from the origin. Even those like Sitte, for instance, that looked in fact at the city, they didn't look at the city for <coughs> issues of uh, conservation or heritage. He was interested in models for, uh, for the modern city, which is good. 
because <laughs> historic city is a model for the modern city, but you know, it was not a, uh, uh, a conservator per se. So we, <laughs> we actually arrived to the beginning of the 20th century without any theory, anything, even regular, it, nobody talks about the city per se. They talk about sometimes the surrounding of monuments, huh? but that's different. <laughs> <clears throat> the only one that looked at city, and I think this is the first research suggestion, was Patrick Geddes. Uh, of course, it's very much studied, Patrick Geddes, but perhaps I think we should resume working on his work. Because he was so good that he sent, they, they were sent away, of course, from the British, you know, so they sent him away because it, he was very intelligent and smart. It was too, creating too many problems in his uh, original Scotland. So they sent him to India. Yeah, where he could do everything he wanted. And in India, he became the first planner of historic cities ever. You know, this is, these are 1910 plans. This is, for instance, a uh, plan of, uh, I think, uh, uh, Indoor. Uh, but there's other, other Lucknow, for instance, uh, Bhaktapur, uh, other, other. There, there are many cities in India that he uh, actually <coughs> studied. And against the uh, interest and against the uh, willingness of the Indians, <laughs> he forced them to preserve them. Right? Now we see today these cities because of uh, this uh, in initial original um, input by, by Patrick Geddes that I, rem I remind you is, was not a, an urban planner, was not an architect, he was a biologist. <laughs> so, so, so he was a, uh, really an interesting figure, <clears throat> revolutionized our profession. And I think a very good PhD thesis should be dedicated to the Indian the Indian input of Patrick Geddes, because I think it's been done, but it, it needs to be re-studied a century later. <coughs> of course, the principles that he was, uh, in, in, say, proposing, uh, something that perhaps today we could question, for instance, he was very much in favor of sort of, you know, lowering the density of uh, uh, the cities, of course, in India and everywhere uh, uh, in the world, the uh, historic cities are overbuilt, you know, so there, because there are stretches, layers, they are, many, many centuries, but so, you know, somehow you can see that there is a, the idea, the house main in idea, of course, taken, you know, with the very, very uh, much attention for the, <coughs> for the historic values is still there. And I'll just clear up a little bit the city so that it becomes usable, uh, a little bit of traffic, people can access these kind of things. But besides these things, uh, which uh, are to be framed in the, in the time, I think it's a, it's a very interesting, uh, and first time looking at the city. And parallel to this, but uh, with a completely different approach, it was, uh, of course, Giovanni that you know very well. Now, he, he has been now reevaluated fully. I'd like to inform you that the Getty Center is publishing a full book like this uh, on the writings of Giovanni in English for the first time. So it's, it's really, uh, really an interesting um, contribution because he's, he actually looked at the city exactly as a complex, you know, he revalued what was never seen, the urban fabric. And of course, to save the urban fabric, he made a proposal of uh, somehow lowering the density, the diradamento, you know, somehow you know, to taking away all the you know, ex excessive buildings and so on. And his, his activity in, in Rome, for instance, was quite, uh, quite interesting. These are, you know, of course, we, we don't agree now with this, with this approach, but you know, I think it was really for the time quite, quite advanced, quite, uh, but again, you know, we, we, talk, we talk about cases, individuals. And most of the, the rest of the world didn't see that. You know, and, and before the thinking of Patrick Geddes, Giovanni, and others came into really <laughs> practice, it took another maybe half a century. Even the famous uh, Athens Conference, inspired by Giovanni and others, the first international conference on heritage, um, yeah, of course, talked about the, mostly about monuments, mostly about the surroundings of monuments, but was not uh, um, really looking at the, at the city uh, per se as, a, as, a, as an entity, as a, as a heritage object, um, which is bad, of course, because at the same time, somebody was looking at the city as an object, <laughs> which was, of course, the other, the, mod the modernist. I have nothing against modernism, actually, congratulations for your modernistic buildings, uh, really a kind of a soft brutalism of the 1980s, which we need. Uh, but, you know, nothing against modernism, uh, but at the same time, you know, of course, he was opposing, you know, there was another kind of stream of thought, you know. Uh, the two things actually lead together.
together. Right? The, the modernism never, never overcame other kind of, <coughs> of, of philosophical and, and empirical uh, approaches. But, uh, but it delayed very much you know, a consideration of the historic city as, a, as an object because it looked in, into other things. And of course, uh, you will know about the provocation on Paris and so on, but essentially the, the, the focus was on other things for many, many decades. Right? And by the way, you know, World War II created so much housing needs and so many problems in terms of uh, responding to the new needs that you know, the historic centers and the city per se was really did not become an issue for another maybe 20 years after, after the World War II. Um, then we had the big, uh, the big uh, uh, moment of principles, Venice Charter. I like the Venice Charter, I'm from Venice, so it's, 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 <laughs> but I like the Venice Charter because it's short, one page. <laughs> Today, when I see a charter, you could like, it's like a little bit of, you know, <laughs> it's like a bibliography, it's not a charter. So it's, so, and, and as a, as a, um, Michael knows, uh, you know, a friend of ours, when we were doing the historical Valencia recommendation, recommended uh, a phrase by Napoleon, not the last guy, who said, constitutions should be short and vague. <laughs> so that inspired us for the historical Valencia, which is short and vague. <laughs> um, but today we like precision, we like to pick you know, the objects that are always three, four groups and by, battling each other, so we, we can find it. So this is nothing, even Venice Charter was totally empty, and believe me, even the World Heritage Convention is nothing compared to in, in the city. Although cities now, historic cities, are the biggest heritage component. Uh, I don't know how many, but around 300 out of 850 cultural sites that one third of the sites in the world are cities. Uh, I think it's a complete distortion, of course, but it, it shows that to have a site in the one at least you have to have a mayor you know, that, that pushes. If you don't have a mayor, you've forgotten. No? And so all the prehistory is forgotten, all the uh, other things. But the convention is zero on cities. <clears throat> in fact, it's so zero that it can e not even say the, the word. <laughs> and still, uh, and so it defines the city as a group of buildings. This is an interesting definition. Of city. It's true, it's factual. A city is a group of buildings. It could be a large group of buildings. A metropolis is a very large group of buildings. But, you know, it's not a very interesting definition uh, in terms of... Uh, um, and believe it or not, this is, as of today, 2022, the definition of cities in the World Heritage Convention. When a historic city is presented to the World Heritage Committee, 2022, no committee, but 2023 maybe, um, it's defined as a group of buildings. And this is, for me, a scandal. So we tried, you know, after the historical Valencia organization, we tried desperately to um, kill this uh, approach, but we did not succeed yet. So let's see if somebody can help. Maybe Harry Land can help make a big screen change the definition or at least adapt it, you know, don't call cities a group of buildings call them a site or call them something else. <clears throat> but so the convention did not help with that, although it promoted the city as a, you know, as a big heritage component. So, you know, uh, in the 1990s, 80s, 90s, you know, there was a rush to sort of fill this gap. And so we have now charters and documents that in fact fill the gap. For instance, the 90s, 80s, 1976 recommendation, the historic uh, areas, very, very, very nice text. I think it's still quite valid in a way. And there could be also another PhD analysis you know, of these uh, approaches, uh, because uh, this is an, an elaborate text, it's not a page, you know, it's really a document um, that really focuses on the historic cities, not only as monuments, but also as social construct. And the Washington Charter. This is the Mama Santissima of, of charters for diplomats. Um, very elaborate, very, very well written, very complete, but very 1980s. It's an approach, 1980s and I would say European 1980s. You know? So it's like an approach in which the state can do everything, can manage, can really manage urban development, can really manage urban transformation. And we know this is, this is not happening. I mean, this, this state is one 
important, of course, of the actors, but you know, there are many other actors, and sometimes these actors are overwhelmingly more powerful than the state in, in, in urban management. So, <coughs> you know, a charter that is entirely based on the fact that everything is possible because the state decides, it's a little bit uh, weak. You know, today we, we, we see the, the limitation, but you know, in terms of uh, uh, philosophy, it's okay. And the Nara Declaration, I think it's nice. We don't talk about cities now, but talks about the diversity and the fact that uh, you know, every region, every uh, cultural culture can express its own vision. And I think it's very important for cities no? because there is, there is a, uh, an issue, maybe you have explored it, that accompanies all this elaboration that as if one single model was possible. That's no way, no way, no way. So no way, <laughs> meaning that it's, we have done a, a research, probably the first and only one so far, um, published in a book called, uh, a book, it's a report called, a UNESCO report called Culture, Urban, Future. I don't know if you've seen it. Have you seen it? Have you read it? Because that is the only existing research in the world, comparative research on urban heritage. Uh, it, I was surprised myself when I, when I looked at it, because of course I looked into the academic thing. I was like, no. What else other types of heritage are studied comparatively? Geology, monuments, they, 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 you have a global view, no global view on cities, so we decided to do it. And this is the only one that exists so far, but of course it's the first one, so it's very <coughs> full of <coughs> limitations. <coughs> so maybe <coughs> another PhD, may, maybe more PhDs, because that's a complicated, <laughs> put together 10 PhDs and do, you know, comparative analysis of urban heritage based on uh, initial findings. So it's, uh, it's very, very important to have this. There. And, and we, the only thing that we found, and I can report to you, is that the world is diff different. The world is diverse. So you know, to apply the same principles to cities in China or India or, or, or South Latin America is just nonsense. You know? So let's, uh, let's be, uh, let's be you know, really flexible on these this issues. So no one model fits all. Finished. By the way, the historical mindset allows this flexibility because it, it, it has been thought for this. Uh, it's based on issue of uh, diversity and principles of diversity. And other things like, I don't, I'm not gonna go into detail, but you know, there are other charters that look into this diversity issue. And, and then we have, of course, the historical landscape, which <coughs> we, uh, when we did, uh, th we thought that we had done a step forward in terms of uh, principles, um, just to discover that we were a little bit in isolation, you know, because again, we were also, you know, like, the, like Icomos does or other that, you know, we were looking at our own navel. You know? <laughs> but in, in reality, we, we quickly realized that this historical landscape doesn't make any sense unless it is connected to other institutions or uh, formulas or uh, movements that look, in, uh, to, they look at social development, uh, that look at, uh, you know, the great issues of the planet from climate change to poverty. And unless we connect it to the SDGs, just to make it uh, short, unless we connect it to the SDGs, it doesn't make any sense. It's another piece of paper. Right? So we did a lot, big effort to, <coughs> to connect it to the SDGs and the, and the urban agenda. Now, I think that after 10 years of this attempt, we, we are connected. We are connected. Uh, so we are offering this as a tool, as an interpretive tool and kind of a, um, yeah, it's a, it's a tool. It's nothing more than a tool that is in line with the SDGs, with the urban agenda and so on. But it's a very humble. You know, it's not, uh, ah, we found a solution, fine, you know, sorry, this, this, this thing don't exist anymore. You now the idea that you do a charter that gives the solution and the, gives the line to the world doesn't exist anymore. We only have to embrace diversity and to embrace uh, complexity. <clears throat> okay, so as you can see, a lot of problems out of the origins, PhD work. Second uh, issue that I want to deal with is conservation, because conservation of historic cities is now it's a big issue. I mean, every city that has any historic value, you know, it's mobilized for this. But <clears throat> I have the feeling that there is a, there's been a problem there because how did we invent conservation for cities? Well, first of all, the only tools available were the ones that came from a century and a half of monument conservation. So 
No, I, I would say that urban conservation is heavily, say, uh, influenced and almost it's almost like a you know a mimic of monument conservation, of course, an adaptation of monument conservation. Um, so it's heavily focused on the physical fabric, less on the social fabric, unfortunately, and it's really tries in every possible form to delimit the perimeter because that the mo monument is a perimeter. It's not something that, you know, uh, so we had this, and, and, and what came out was good. I mean, in fact, what came out was this guy, another one that I would study. Mr. Marro, he looks like, you know, coming out of a Hitchcock movie, but <laughs> Mr. Marro, the Minister of Culture of France, who after having spent uh, you know, some time in jail for having stolen Cambodian artifacts, became Minister of Culture. <laughs> it was the best buddy of, of, of uh, Charles de Gaulle, so it's okay. And um, <clears throat> it's true, right? he spent some time in jail for that. Um, but in the 1960s or early 60s, he had this idea because, you know, at that time France and like the rest of Europe were, you know, doing a lot of uh, uh, renovations. I remember the big uh, changes in Paris, but I'm sure you go to Amsterdam, you find the same things. You go to every other city in Europe, you find, you know, very revolutionary changes of just throwing away the old and middle, making new and so on. So he thought that this was excessive, you know, and that it was a big risk for heritage areas, or what he thought of the heritage edge, of great importance. So he, Marot, invented the Loi Marot, which is a, a law that essentially gives 40% um, uh, reduction for uh, income tax for taxes, and of course a lot of subsidies. This is still going on. This is called uh, the Loi for Secteur Sauvegardé uh, in France. It's a very active, and in fact, you know, it worked very well because you know, many cities like, uh, for instance, Arles, beautiful city, or, um, uh, or, or uh, Aix-en-Provence, uh, you name it, there are very many cities that have been really <coughs> well preserved. Uh, this model, the idea that you create a perimeter, you know, like, a, like a precinct, and you say, that's historic, so 40%, uh, many other things, regulations of different uh, finance, uh, taxations, and so on, is the one that has been, become, has become the global model for dealing with issues of historicity. So you find it everywhere. Um, going around the world, you find it, uh, you find it in England, uh, it's Cambridge, beautiful Cambridge. Uh, <coughs> you find it in, in Morocco, this is a, you know, the city of Mugamba, was described in the World Heritage List. Uh, you find it in Quebec, uh, you find it everywhere. You find it in Italy, even in Italy. Italy was parallel to France, created sim similar tools, huh? because we, our laws in 1967 was the law that protected historic uh, cities. Yeah, same idea, creating a perimeter, and then you have, and then China, and this is Pingyao in China, I don't know if you've been there, fantastic place, um, uh, totally, identical to what it was, uh, so, and totally remade identical to what <laughs> it used to be, but in a very Chinese way. Uh, now recently also, Ahmedabad, the only Indian city uh, in the World Heritage List. You know, the Indians never thought that cities were, were uh, heritage. Uh, and Michael knows, because we've done many, many, <laughs> many workshops in India just to try to convince the Indians that they had interesting uh, heritage cities, but they were looking at me, at us, uh, very, very strangely, saying, no, no, cities are not heritage. How can it be heritage? There's no, no way of building or ma managing it. For them, for them, heritage is that monument managed by the ecological survey, the, the, the rest is. Um, we, <coughs> we tried, for instance, you know, to, we, we thought it was an easy way, we tried to convince them to inscribe Chandigarh, like modernist thing. And Chandigarh is very compact, so it's <coughs> relatively well managed. So, so I, we talked to the lieutenant government, who was the, the governor, who was the delegate of the governor, and said, no way, I mean, no way, Chandigarh, this is not an Indian city. This European city, no, <laughs> it's an Indian city. <laughs> so anyway, we, 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 we worked 10 years on that, and we failed, because when they inscribed 
Chandigarh, they only describe the Acropolis or whatever, and not the rest of the city. Uh, anyway, so uh, the world is, the life is made up of defeats. Um, but Ahmedabad, because also it's a base of a uh, current prime minister, was inscribed. So that's what, same, same idea. Hmm? And then, of course, you find it in Latin America. So, I, mean, I would say it's everywhere. Everywhere, the same model. Essentially, a center that is perimeter, that is historic, and then a buffer zone around that. I call it the spaghetti model. <laughs> spaghetti, a tomato spaghetti, which means that it's, it's any, you know, this is just a story, but you know, it's the idea. You know, the city, historic city is something closed, possibly with walls, and, you know, and, and then sometimes around. Now, this fortunately is changing. I want to show you an example, but you know, <coughs> what I'm saying that we have one model that is spreading around the world that is really very, say, monumental and physically focused, and it's really exclusive of other things. Well, you know, and, and this is a totally top-down model. You know, some, somebody comes from the government, from the experts, ICOMOS, uh, UNESCO, who, know, who knows, and says, okay, city is like this. The rest, non-historical. Historical, non-historical. You can understand that this is not really a problem, you know, in terms of, uh, um, <coughs> of managing uh, the future of these historic areas. So there have been some changes. I'm going to show one, only one of them. Uh, there are others. This is the city of Bologna uh, in Italy. Uh, which was one of the protagonists of the innovation in her heritage conservation, historic urban heritage conservation. And you see that this is a city, a very medieval city with this, you know, a, a, a contour present of walls. Walls don't exist anymore, they've been demolished in the 19th century, but the shape is there. So uh, this kind of hexagonal or octagonal shape. And that was the historic center. You know, in the 1960s, when they did the first plan, that was the historic center. That was the, the area subject to conservation. In the 2005-7, when the city redid the, the, the master plan, they took a bottom-up approach for the first time. Thank you. <laughs> so they asked the people. They made an you know, inquiry and asked people, what do you think is historic heritage? And the, the answer is this one. So because all the 19th century areas around the medieval city were considered historical by the inhabitants. Huh? And even that block over there, you see on the top, it's a 1950 uh, popular housing, uh, low, low cost housing, but high quality, low cost housing. So the, <coughs> the people said, this is so well done that we want to preserve it as heritage. So the city extended the definition of historic uh, uh, city like this. I think it's a great example. And it shows also that you can change, <coughs> can evolve, and who knows. You know? uh, so historic. Uh, is not a fixed idea, but this is a, a rare occasion, a uh, rare, rare case. So we have to look at other other situations. Okay, so um, let's look at the third and perhaps bigger. You mentioned that change. How does you know, conserv urban conservation addresses change? This is a big thing. Uh, we we don't know because uh, um, heritage is based on stopping change. You know, the, all the heritage construction is somehow to preserve. So in a way, you are anti-change. And this posture, <coughs> you find it everywhere, from all the e-commerce charters to, to all the everything. Everything is no change, or little change, let's say. Or, or, or say, uh, how they call it, uh, acceptable change. But you know, acceptable change means they already have to make an effort <laughs> to accept the change. So I think we have a big issue there. And no tools, or very little tools. Let me show you some, I, some, some aspects of this. Uh, the urban fabric, to begin with. Do we have tools to control the urban fabric? No, uh, or at least uh, not everywhere. This is, these are the two pictures of Kathmandu War Heritage Site. In 1970 and year 2000, 30 years. You now you can see 1970, well, maybe not see very well, but you, know, you can see 1970 was quite uh, intact. You know, kind of fabric, traditional fabric surrounding these beautiful monuments. And in 30 years, the city just popped up into a concrete and bricks uh, fabric that totally, totally, totally annihilated the traditional fabric. So even a World Heritage Site cannot preserve its fabric. Um, we had another case in Yemen, for instance, Zabid, uh, 
know, it's, it's a city on the coast by the Red Sea, completely uh, gone, except for the few monuments. So <clears throat> the approach is, okay, monuments are these ones, are set, the rest is. Now, of course, I'm not saying that this is a fault of the people because, of course, they respond, respond to some needs. But at the same time, it shows that we have zero ability to <laughs> sort of manage this, or at least not, not everywhere. So problem with the fabric, big problems. And <clears throat> we could show examples also in, in this continent uh, for that. Then the other one that has no tools or little tools is the urban landscape. Of course, you know, we started with big examples. This is it through Montparnasse, 1972, one or two was, was finished, and over 1973, which, you know, uh, fortunately was so bad that it saved Paris from other things, you know, like this, because people were horrified. But now it's coming back huh? after, after 50 years that there is a new wave of uh, uh, towers uh, in Paris. But <coughs> <coughs> the idea that you can come and, uh, you know, in a landscape, even an important landscape like Paris, and do something like this, it means that you have no control of anything. You know? and, um, and I think this raises an issue that uh, I think it's important, very often not considered by, by planners and so on that normally city is seen as a kind of bidimensional, you protect areas, but it's not seen three-dimensional. Three no? A plan should be a three-dimensional plan no? so that you can shape the city as you want. Uh, if, if you don't put this dimension, this 3D dimension in the plan, then you leave the market free to do whatever they want or they can because there are, of course, uh, lots of pressures for this. Anyway, this issue of, uh, <coughs> of uh, uh, high rise in historic areas is so big that I will just give you some example, but of course we need to really focus on that because as, unless we do it, all the uh, talks on historical landscape, uh, all the talks on conservation uh, and heritage and landscape as a part, common good, I mean, they're talks. You know, we, have, we need to have tools on that. Remember the, the famous, this is a World Heritage Site, Tower of London, but the reality of the Tower of London is this one. Right? So <laughs> they made, unfortunately, the British this, <clears throat> this planned disaster of transferring the city's uh, high rise into the center of London instead of leaving it in, a, you know, in, a, in the docks like it was done very carefully and very, very well before. The, and of course, destroying uh, you know, the entire landscape of, of this uh, historic area. You all remember the tragedy of Vienna, which is still going on. Vienna in the danger list uh, because of uh, high rise buildings. It was earlier on in 2003, but which forced them to do something like that. So that, that we were effective in somehow changing the, the, but things everywhere. This is Cologne, for instance. This is Baku, been to Baku. These are the flames of oil coming out of the earth. And you know, Baku is the, is the place where the Zaratustra religion came about because uh, the, the, there is a natural um, the Florence of uh, oil, and this burns, no, sorry, flames come out, and it's the flames. Uh, and then we had St. Petersburg, which was a successful one. Uh, yeah, this one, this is St. Petersburg. They went, that was near, they were hired, and we made a big battle, and at the end, even Putin said, basta, no, <laughs> okay, but they moved it 10 miles away, and it's, it's there, and this building has been done. Then we have the, um, Tehran, which is uh, Isfahan, I mean, it's a fantastic place, you know, and a puff, you know, things coming up out of this fantastic mix of, you know, roofs and vegetations and so on. <coughs> and then you have other things. I mean, you are talking about the heights, but there is also other things, like modern architecture, of course. Now, this is, people like it, but in, in China, but this is in, in front of the, of, the, of the Forbidden City. Um, I, you know, I... Had many discussions with my friends, architects, including Remkulas. You know, <coughs> architecture cannot consider to be free of context. <laughs> this has never been uh, since the pyramids. No, I don't know why now it's, this is allowed. So this is, for instance, an example because the designer Paul Andre, by the way, very nice and friend of mine, a nice, very nice man. He was specialized in airports. He, he did the Charles de Gaulle 1, Charles de Gaulle 2, Charles de Gaulle 3, Charles de Gaulle 4, all, all the airports in France. So he did an airport in the middle of uh, Beijing. <laughs> Very nice airport, but nothing to do with Beijing. So, and, and things like that, like, you see, that's, you see, that's a forbidden city, that's the, that's the opera. 
So I'm just saying there is too much uh, lassitude on architecture. Uh, they should be controlled. I mean, this is not, uh, it's not against the architect. I like, like architects. I like the way in which you can innovate in design. No problems. Uh, some good examples exist, but others are, you know. Ugh. Okay, Peter Cook, okay, San, Santa Santorum, but you know, why do we have to have, you know, a, uh, I call it the alien, by the way, which is probably the right name. Um, then another Santa Santorum, Gary, and, but then, you know, this is, these are the big ones, at least they have some idea, but then you have the imitators, you know, this is, this is the central square of Santiago in Chile. This is the most important cathedral, Baroque cathedral of the country. Look at what they have allowed on the sign of it. Right? So, so, okay, so architecture is another issue. And then infrastructure, of course. Uh, that's Genoa, for instance, totally de destroyed this relationship. You know, it's a big freeway in the middle between the city and the harbor. Um, where's the Yonja? Yonja, 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 there. Another hooligana. Um, this is your city, Istanbul. I had a long discussion with the mayor of Istanbul. I said, hey, why do you on earth need to have a, a bridge that competes with the, with the, with the mosques there just behind? Now with, and I went, well, a bridge doesn't need to have, especially not a big bridge. I mean, no, no way. Um, and this, which I think is the epitome of everything, the, this circular freeway around the Panama Viejo uh, World Heritage Site in Panama. Uh, this is a way to deal with an historic city. Was it? Anyway, so there is a there are many issues, but you see, I, I showed three three areas: high rise, architecture, infrastructure, where we literally have no tools or very little tools. So we have to think about and reflect. And <coughs> talking only about the physical fabric, but then we have the social fabric, and this is a big issue. Uh, because the city, as we, historic city, as we want to consider it, and I hope every land agrees with this, it's not just, just physical fabric, it's also it's a society. Uh, and if you look at you know, our charters, they talk about, you know, and there is also the society, and there is, a, but you know, this is, you know, on the contrary, it should be the opposite. You know, it should be that we have a society and then we have its physical fabric, which sometimes is inherited, sometimes is produced, we don't look at that in a very uh, serious uh, uh, way. And unfortunately, although uh, we've seen the physical fabric changes, also the social fabric changes, maybe even more rapidly you know, because uh, of many social processes. For instance, all the historic cities I know have gone into colossal social transformation in the past century, you know? <coughs> especially because of the decline of their industrial role. I mean, all, this, all the historic cities were productive places, no? Uh, they had factories of all sorts. Uh, you go to Lyon. Have you been to Lyon? Fantastic, World Heritage City. Okay, there is an entire hill, which you see, it's called the Croix Rousse, which was for centuries the heart of silk production in Europe. Uh, it was one of the richest cities in, in Europe. Lyon was also one of the big market fair cities in the Middle Ages and so on, and later on became the silk producers of the continent. So the entire hill, the entire hill, I can tell you, is made up of factories. People were living in the factories, so different than today, so we're living. So these houses of the Croix Rouge are very strange because the typology is influenced by the production. So no, normally the floors are five meters, you know, because they had to put, you know, all the machines and looms and so on. Um, now, all this gone completely and, and changed into you know, nice residential homes for uh, richer people and so on, and what we call gentrification, we'll, we'll see in a minute. Uh, we'll talk about my city. My city was an industrial city. It was, you know, nobody thinks of Venice as an industrial city. It was a, a very big industrial center. You know, this building that you see over there, it's called Mulino Stucchi, was one of the largest uh, wheat mills in Europe. And <coughs> it's not Venetian architecture, more like Hamburg. You know, the architect was in Hamburg. Um, this was closed uh, in the 1950s, I think, yes. Um, gone through a number of, of uh, uh, dramas, uh, 
the founder was assassinated because by, a, by one of his workers who was a lover of his wife. And one of these things are dramatic, you know, but, but you know, it survived even these catastrophic uh, things. Um, and this is the, the one I issued, the Judeca. Judeca was, Judeca was Jewish, no? Judeca was, yeah. Well, which is what? Yeah, but it's like five, it's ten? Because you spoke more, eh? <laughs> I, I, I have a watch. You spoke until 10.05. So you're, you're, it ends, <laughs> no, uh, let's say I go until 11, okay? I have seven minutes, right? Compromise. All right, the other one is the Arsenale, the biggest factory in Europe in the, in the Middle Ages. You know, it was producing one galleon a day, and so gone. So oh, oh, clearly, <laughs> and I can go for many examples, but clearly there are every city has gone through these processes. So, and normally, in many cases, the historic city has, because of its density, compactness, and so on, has become the receptacle of migrations. Uh, we have many, many cases. Uh, but one in Italy, for instance, Genoa. If you've ever been to Genoa, it's, it's, uh, Genoa is, it's, a, it's a very beautiful city, very elegant and so on. But then you go to the sand, historic center and you find yourself in a casbah. It's like Mediterranean casbah, no? um, with migrants uh, from Africa, from Latin America, from everywhere. It's, uh, we, they found it. And similarly, we find Kas the casbah in Algiers. You go to the casbah of Algiers is the place of migrants because it's, of course, the quality of the housing is very uh, low and so on. So there's the first. And Delhi, I don't know if you've been to Delhi, the city, the historic city of Delhi, the largest market in the world. It's an enormous complex of, uh, you know, that absorbed like a sponge, you know, the migration of a continent. So this has been a very important role. But at the same time, we had changes. And there we come. Gentrification is the is the issue. Now we had uh, this forever. Now uh, I'm not gonna go many, many examples, but uh, you go around the world, you find them everywhere. In London, inner London, which was an industrial area, you find them in the Marais, which <laughs> was also a very uh, productive area in Paris. Um, now gentrification has even become a, an official term, you know? It's like part of the administrative term. Notice of proposed gentrification. <coughs> and then, after the gentrification, I could have put tourism before the gentrification, but they go together in a way. Tourism is the one we should discuss perhaps more, because that's really what's eating up, you know, everything, and creating an enormous pressure and disturbance. Now you know about these issues in Venice, Venezia, non and Albergo, and so on. And tourism is becoming a very, very big issue that you know we have difficulties in, in management. And then, of course, we have other issues like conflict and terror, which I will show, show you. I, I have to, to accelerate because uh, you know, Gertian is looking at me. So, so bombing of Dubrovnik, uh, destruction of Aleppo, um, destruction of Mariupol, uh, and, and of course even terrorism. So all these are issues that you know, we have problems uh, in dealing with. No, we have no, no, no tools or perhaps too insufficient tools. Okay, these are my questions. And this, after all these things, we need to look at what, okay, what do we do? Uh, but perhaps let's try to see if the questions are good. So don't worry, if the questions are good, we can find some solution. So first of all, what is an historic city? I'm not giving answers. Uh, the answer is for Gertiana. I, I, I only open questions. What is an historic city? And the, the, the reply to this is almost a guide to what we have to do. Whose heritage is it? Who owns the thing? And I am not uh, one of those that think that the inhabitants only should own it. I think it should be now bigger. I think there are many communities, including us, this, this is a community, that should have a say on it, let's say. Which are the values that we attach to this heritage complex and how we ensure its sustainability. This is a future outlook, perhaps uh, something to... Now, is there any solution? Well, uh, I don't know, but let's see. I think Heriland is the territory that we uh, have to explore to um, find solution. I found a few things, but you know, allow me to say that I think it's, it's just a modest contribution. But for instance, I found some very interesting thing in Amsterdam, because Amsterdam was, uh, had a big reaction. And your city imbalance program is a very, it's the most co complete analysis of the issue. I am not sure it works. It's for you to tell me. 
Uh, but at least it's a good, it's a good grid of analysis. Um, it's not against tourism, which should be wrong, and is uh, for a balanced city, which now everybody has a place, and uh, through a system of processes, plans, and behaviors, uh, guidance. I don't know if it works. Maybe uh, I'm here also to, to, to discover. Um, Barcelona had similar problems, and <clears throat> they are doing something, but they, I think they're taking uh, the wrong approach, because or the wrong, or at least partial approach, because they only see the tourism as a problem, not the rest. They say, okay, we have to defend ourselves against the tsunami. You know, this is one issue, but they also have to look at the, you know, what kind of the other issue that Amsterdam is, is checking on. Um, Venice, I have no idea. Now they're experimenting the uh, ticket to come into the city. I can predict that it's going to fail miserably because you can't put the ticket for a city. And it's just a <laughs> yeah. and uh, you know they start saying, oh, but it's only three euro, from three to ten. Okay, and then exemptions. Yeah. Exemptions are relatives to, to the third degree. All the inhabitants of the Veneto region, five million people. Uh, all those guys <laughs> become like you need an entire administration just to manage that. I don't think it will work. So that's not a good a good uh, direction. Um, New Orleans has a big issues, uh, and I think they're doing interesting thing again. They they try to regulate especially Airbnb, which is the apple that manages cities in the world. Uh, no mayor has more power than that. Um, and also there are good interesting documents. This is New Orleans that, that come out of that city. So there are examples, say, issues. People are trying to react. But um, when Venice is, oh, this is Dubrovnik, actually. Actually, Dubrovnik has found some solution. This is the mayor of Dubrovnik. Some, a guy that you know has some good ideas. He negotiated with, but you know it's a smaller place. Um, and of course, and I will finish now here because it's one one two minutes before my end. Um, we have to look a lot at the at the digital uh, revolution, which is you know, something that I have not considered. Now, <coughs> let me finish with this. You all know Cedric Price, one of our monsters. He had very brilliant idea, you know, and which is pictured in this thing. I think we should consider this because it's not far from what we're saying. Okay, the ancient city was a closed thing with the, with the boiled egg. 17th century is a, my spaghetti plan, but the modern is like more like a, a Chinese soup. So thank you very much. I look forward to discussing, discussing with you all this issue and hopefully continue our work together. Thank you. broad picture that you've given us and um, very unfortunately we don't have time for questions as you can see you guys have started late and it will be I was a bit late as well but um, yes we like to have to stick uh, to stick to the program and uh, however what I want to say is that you've brought up questions yourself so many questions so many issues and we will all take this with us into the next sessions, I suggest. As a matter of fact, we have uh, sessions on changing environment, on uh, gentrification, which will be discussed in uh, um, shifting demographies, etc. So uh, I'd like to invite you now all to um, join us in moving over to specific rooms. Um, First, go and move out here, and um, it's just from 20 meters to your right there will be coffee and tea served. After which, there will be student assistants that will bring you to the specific room. And you've all registered for a specific uh, workshop, so please look for those two that represent your workshop. Thank you very much again, Professor Bangladesh.